I decided to have two separate talks in this morning slot. So one is uh, a very introduction to chemical uh, to chemistry or to chemical kinetics because this is the basis for chemical computing. And I will tell you about kinetic equations first because um, our strategies uh, of uh, information processing with chemistry are based on uh, theoretical predictions using kinetic equations. I presume not too many of you know how to write a kinetic equation if you know that reactions between A and B and C molecules proceed. And then I will start a more sophisticated subject, a, a computation with a st uh, structure medium, but this, this will be after my first. Part. So please do not hesitate to ask me any questions to interrupt if you, if, you, if you like an extra explanation. I will be happy to do it. Okay, now let's see if it works. So I start with a few personal remarks uh, about my vision of computing. And well, mm, computing is a physical phenomenon. It says, it says, so we need a computing medium to process information. And this medium uh, evol evolves according, its time evolution is determined by physics. We can do nothing about how the medium behaves. It's, there are laws of physics and they determine its evolution. Well, we, we should have control over this medium to introduce information to it. And, but there are two human aspects. One is input, another is output. We should be able to interpret the input information, and we should interpret what the output is. is uh, what is the output coming? And let me show you one example of such system. Okay, so this is, I would say, it's a training kit for people called Baal. There were priests in Sumer, and they were supposed to predict the future. For example, economy, war strategy, politics. They slaughtered a ship, then took the ship's liver, and observing the ship's liver, they were able to tell what is, what is in the future? I, I believe that well, present market prediction is based, is, has the ac accuracy very similar to what Sumerians or Babylonians did 4,000 years ago. Actually, we still use the trick of computing medium. I don't know, I wasn't interested, but which animal uh, decides about the results of the matches this mundial? I think there was a squid once, and there was another animal, and people generally interpreted the behavior of the animals, the input was animal, and let's say two pots with flags of different countries, and they interpreted the motion of, of the animal as an information processing medium. So actually, there are different media, and well, you can, you can claim that, let's say, quantum computing is better than sheep liver, which hasn't been proven yet if concerned economy, and well, Babylonia was a pretty stable country basing on this type of information processing. Okay, so let me go to the next slide. Well, the motivation for chemical, uh, there are two motivations for chemical computing. First is the fact that in our brain, as you saw yesterday, Computing is based on, on electrochemical reactions. And actually, our brain or animal brain is a set of neurons that send signals in a type of action potential. And this potential is related to opening of calcium and uh, um, sodium channels. And there is a miracle called synapse that transmits signals between neurons. And signals are integrated, and so on, and so on, and so on yesterday. So this is one funny part. But there's another funny part of the story, that this wonderful computer is self-generated. So actually, nature created conditions at which 
chemical computer can be self-generated, can appear, and well, after some time it's of training, it, it operates well, as we believe, quite reasonably. So this, this gives me one motivation to study to study chemical computing. Another motiv can, could you hear me? Yeah, okay. Another motivation is that chemical computing, in the way I show uh, during the next slot, is pretty cheap. So I do not need too much funds to, to go with it. Okay, so this is what I promised to tell. Uh, I start with chemical reaction kinetics. Who of you can write kinetic reaction for this process? Hands up. Oh, Peter, you know why. I expected your hand up, but yes. Okay, so chemical reaction is interaction between molecules. Two molecules come together, they can separate, they can merge, they can generate other processes. Have in mind that molecules are flying in space. That's, that's a kind of gas reaction, but actually this approximation is used on, also in more dense medium. So if we consider the reaction between A and B, then the rate of such reaction is proportional to the number of molecules or to density of molecules of A and density of molecules B. It's like in probability. You're supposed to select a random molecule of A and random molecule of B and check in how many ways you can select such molecules. So, well, of course, if molecules meet, if you select a pair of molecules that are meeting, it's not necessary that they react. Some reactions are slow, some reactions are fast. So it's not surprising that this appearance of A molecule will be proportional to the product of concentrations of A and concentration of B multiplied by a magic number that represents the speed of a given reaction. So in this reaction, A disappears, and if we like to say what is the rate of change of concentration of A, chemists sometimes use small letters, sometimes use brackets to denote concentration, so if you like to say what is the change in concentration of A, then we write a term. This rate is proportional to the concentration of molecules of A, the, the concentration of the molecules of B, and is multiplied by a characteristic rate of this reaction. Uh, there is another reaction. Here you have arrow this way, and A disappears in the reaction between A and B. But A may appear in very complex reaction, which is not very realistic, because it's hard to find four molecules coming together. But let's assume that, well, it happens. So A can appear in reaction between C to D and T. E. We have reaction, reverse reaction, a reaction proceeding from right to the left, and its rate is yet another constant, concentration of C, concentration of E, but you need two D molecules. So actually you should select two D molecules, and the number of pairs you can select from a given set is proportional to N n minus 1 over 2 if there are n molecules of, of, of D. So actually it comes out that, well, this minus, if n is large, then minus 1 doesn't matter, and it's proportional to the square of concentration of D. And this is the way how, how rate equations that describe the time evolution of chemical system are written. So actually if you have a reaction in which alpha molecules of A collide with beta molecules of B, then the rate of such reaction is proportional to A to power alpha and B to power beta, and similarly, it's here. Is all clear? Okay. So we are interested, for, for the sake of chemical processing, in the stationary state of such reaction. A stationary state of chemical reaction is a kind of dynamical balance. So actually, uh, well, roughly speaking, similar number of reactions between A and B uh, occur in a given time as the reactions 
uh, from C, D, and T to, to A. So uh, we can calculate the stationary state, and in stationary state, the concentration, the change of concentration is zero. So you just set the right side of kinetic equation. Uh, 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 well, you solve the equation in which the right side of kinetic equation is set to be zero, and we have condition. At, at a stationary state, we have the following relationship between concentration of A, B, C, D, and T. Okay. If so, you can solve a couple of simple examples, what you can calculate with chemical reactions. Let's assume the following reaction scheme. We have reaction between A and presumably something, a source of molecules that's large enough not to, be, not to consider that it changes in time, that produces A and X. And then we have another process in which X disappeared. It's graphically illustrated A, transformed into X, and X disappears later. Uh, well, so what is the relationship between input and product? What is the kinetic equation? And how those molecules change in time? So what happens, what, what, what you can say about the concentration of A molecules? Does the number of A molecules change in time or not? No, because there's one molecule here, and after reaction, the same molecule. Sorry. That's my mistake. Oops. Sorry about it. Maybe I switch it off and then. I, sh I, I should have done it earlier. Uh, okay, so the number of, L of A molecules doesn't change in time. But what about X molecules? X molecules are produced of A molecules, and this rate is Kr1 multiplied by concentration of A, and they disappear in the reaction uh, involving X, and uh, the, the rate of disappearance is proportional to the rate to the concentration of X. So if we look at kinetic equation, so, then the kinetic equations oops, are the following. The, con the change in concentration of A is zero. The change of concentration of X is proportional to K1A. This is the inflow of X molecules. And it's uh, minus outflow of, of X molecules in this reaction. If you solve this system of equation, this is pretty easy because uh, the, the, these uh, differential equations are linear. Then you have this solution. If you wait sufficiently long, so chemical computer, such chemical computer doesn't give you an instantaneous answer, but you should wait until this factor is not important. Then in the long time limit, the concentration of X is proportional to concentration of A. And the proportionality constant is the ratio of those two rate constants. So actually, this system is a multiplier. If you consider concentration of A as an input and concentration of X as an output, then this system multiplies one number, the input, but a constant that is determined by chemical processes you're involved. So actually, you can multiply two num a number by a fixed, well, a number kept in a memory using chemical reaction and observing what's going on. OK, this is easy. But here are more complex systems. What you can expect, the concentration of X here 
it disappears, the, the, the molecules of eggs, they disappear in this process, but they are born from A and from B. So actually you can expect that the inflow that is proportional to A and B, to B, it's a sum of, of, of molecules of X that are born in this process, and this is a sum of molecules of X born in this process, is balanced with the outflow of molecules of X. So actually, the number of molecules of X should be proportional to A and to B multiplied by the following rate constant. So actually, this system gives you the concentration of X that's a sum of concentration of A and B multiplied by, by, by factors. This is another system. Here, okay, we have outflow of X, but the inflow is controlled by concentration, by reaction between A and B. Here, just a single molecule of X, of, of A, was transformed into a molecule of X. But in this example, you, you need a molecule of A, and the molecule of A reacts with a molecule of B and produces X. So if you have bimolecular reaction, if you recall the first slide I was showing, then this rate is proportional to concentration of A and concentration of B. So we can expect that the concentration of X you, we observe will be proportional to uh, a product of concentrations of A and proportional and concentration of B. So we know how to sum two numbers, how to multiply two numbers, and here there's yet another scheme in which molecules of X are created from molecules of A, so this process is proportional to uh, the number, the concentration of molecules of A, but its outflow to, to uh, Mm, um, uh, destroy a molecule of A, you need a molecule of B. This is reaction between X and B. So actually the outflow is proportional to concentration of A and concentra uh, concentration of X and concentration of B. So if so, uh, you can expect that this process balances this process. This process is proportional to A, this process is proportional to X multiplied by B. So if you extract X, we should have a factor A over B, where A, B, uh, where there are concentrations of those products. So we can sum, multiply, or divide two numbers. And actually, if you look at the pictures, once again, here are the processes. X is born in reaction with A, X is born in reaction with B, X disappears, and the kinetic equation is the following. So actually, if you calculate the uh, stationary concentration, it's proportional to the sum. Here, A, B remain, so X is generated by a binary process, and if you solve the equation, then stationary uh, concentration is proportional to A and B. Here, we have process in which X is generated, and it X disappears, and stationary concentration is, um, uh, uh, is A over B, where A, B are initial concentration of those processes. So using initial concentrations and studying a concentration of a selected reagent, you can perform simple arithmetics. Uh, well, it's not the whole story. I won't tell you the whole story, but you can do arithmetics. You can do more complex operation. Let's assume that we generate X in the process in which input molecules of uh, a are transformed into X, but it disappears in a binary reaction. So actually, we have such term, two molecules disappear in this process. Actually, if we have them transformed into X 
direction scheme will be the same, but the, the factor that there will be just one instead of two factor. Anyway, we have the following reaction kinetics, and the stationary concentration is just the square root of this concentration of input reagent A. And, well, you can work out that the same applies to many bonds. And here are two coupled reactions, and you can show that uh, the stationary concentration is the following factorial that involves many concentrations. So actually you can do a bit of arithmetics with uh, chemistry, and I would like to focus on this reaction scheme and give you a problem to think about. If, you, if somebody can explain me after lunch, uh, can answer my question after lunch, I will be happy. Uh, okay, let's assume that we have the following reaction scheme. Uh, molecules of X and Y are the molecules we are interested in, they are the molecules uh, we call the output of our chemical system. So actually, uh, we are interested in concentrations of those molecules as a function of input, as of concentration of input molecules of A and B. Uh, the reactions are the following. X is born from A, Y is born from B, X disappears, Y needs X to disappear. If you write kinetic equations, then they look in the following way. Okay, X appears in this reaction, so we have concentration of A. X disappears in this reaction, so we have concentration of X here. X disappears in this reaction, so we have products of X and Y. This is the concentration of Y. It appears in this reaction, disappears in this reaction. Okay, uh, so appearance and disappearance are marked by signs. If you solve the right side of this equation to find the stationary state, then this is the answer. What does this answer mean? Okay, we can calculate, uh, we can uh, subtract concentration of B uh, from concentration of A. So actually this reaction scheme calculates you uh, minus uh, A minus B. But come on, this is a chemical reaction. I can pour more B than A. So what does it mean? It means that stationary concentration is negative. Oh, you're killed as a chemist. So could you explain, maybe after lunch, why it's so and how, why this reaction scheme that seems to be quite all right can give you negative stationary concentration. Treat it as an exercise. Okay, can I follow on? If somebody wanted to copy it. Well, so this is the uh, arithmetics based on chemistry, but if you have, um, if you cut your output information in concentrations of chemical substances, it's hard to get negative number because concentration should be okay. In the worst case, it's zero, but generally it's positive. Then we have low accuracy of, of calculations. If the relative, the relative accuracy is one over n when n is the number of product molecules. So let's assume that you want to calculate 30 digits of output, and you can you do it with quad precision in most of the compilers. Then 1 over n makes, well, one mole of a substance is uh, roughly speaking 10 to 23 of molecules, 6 multiplied by 10 to 23 molecules. So it makes, um, well, 1 million moles, one million moles of, of, of water, let's say, is, is, is a size of pool. So actually having 
uh, trying to, to, to make chemical computation with 30 digits, you need to measure a single molecule in a pool of water, in an average garden pool of water. That's incredible. You cannot do it. And there are fluctuations. Because, okay, it, everything looks very nice on the picture, let's say here, we have this uh, exponential approach to equilibrium, but in practice, when the numbers of molecules are close to equilibrium, they can fluctuate. And those fluctuations are on the order of square root of molecule, and of course, they affect the precision. So this is nice theoretical concept, but I'm not sure if somebody will use it in future. But people observed in the 90s, people has noticed something different. So let's consider reaction model. It's very common reaction model for enzymatic reaction. E is enzyme, bi biological enzyme, for example. S is substrate. And enzyme combines with substrate. En enzyme is usually a big protein that has a hole somewhere. And the, 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 the molecule that's processed by the enzyme is attracted in this hole in an enzyme. And then something happens, uh, usually vibrational states uh, of the enzyme correlate with vibrations of the molecule of substrate. And, well, some magic, sorry. And you got uh, enzyme is separated, but you got another molecule, a molecule of product. Usually, this reaction is pretty fast. It's much faster than the reaction that leads to a product. If so, we can assume that this reaction is in quasi-stationary state. So the same number of complex uh, between enzyme and substrate are formed as the number of uh, molecules that's, uh, of enzyme that separate between enzyme and uh, substrate. If so, the reaction scheme can be simplified. And uh, unlike it was on examples uh, I've shown you before, we have a kinetics that depends on the substrate concentration in the form substrate divided by uh, the term, a constant, plus concentration of a substrate. What does it mean? If substrate concentration is very small, then you can, then K is larger. So at small concentrations of substrate, this, the rate of product production grows linearly with the substrate. But if substrate concentration is large, then, well, K is not important, and you have substrate concentration divided by substrate concentration, which means one, and the kinetics doesn't depend on substrate concentration. So actually, what you observe is that if here is the substrate concentration and this is the rate of product production, then you have, well, a sigmoidal-like curve. Well, it, it was known since, let's say, uh, 1910. It's called michaelis menten kinetics. Very basic for, for people who study enzymatic reaction. But if you look at this curve and at the transistor characteristics, then they are so similar. So maybe we can do logic, not with transistor, but with enzymatic reaction. And the idea was developed in the 90s by uh, Okamoto, Himfeld, Ross, Weinberger, and this is what they proposed. They suggested the following reaction scheme. The input is coded in molecules of C that transform, well, yet another molecules. They, 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 they were chemists, so this scheme involves uh, reverse reactions and binary reactions. Okay, this is single molecule reaction, but it doesn't look very unrealistic from chemical point of view. So the, mo the input molecules are here, and they can be transformed into molecules of X. Molecules of X can react with B, produce something, 
and produce molecules of A. Then molecules of A can tr be transformed into B in this reaction, and, well, we have uh, also yet another molecule that is transformed into something and is delivered. Uh, the concentrations of molecules, which are marked with star, are kept constant. So there is a lot of them. For example, if you have water solution of enzymes, then you can have a very teeny amount of enzyme and a lot of water. So it's interesting to see what happens to enzymes, but it's not interesting to, to, to see what are the changes of concentration of water because you don't notice that. Uh, there are two, okay, so the input is coded in this C, mole, in concentration of C molecules, and output is coded in concentration of B molecules or in concentration of A molecules. And now, well, the, 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 there are rate constants they were given for this reaction, and this is, this is what is the answer. So if concentration of C is below one, then concentration of A is uh, at very close to zero. If concentration of C is above one, then concentration of A jumps to one. Uh, if concentration of C is uh, below one, then concentration of B is one. If concentration of C is larger than one, then concentration of B is zero or close to zero. What does it mean? If we cut a state, if we use digital logic, and let's assume that we divide true and false state at the level of one, then concentration of C below one, let's say it's a false, uh, has false logic value, and concentration of A is false as well. Here is true and true. So actually, this is identity gate if you use concentration of C as an input and concentration of A as an output. If you take concentration of B, then C is in a false state, but B is true. C is in a true state, but B is false. So using B, this is not gate. So actually, you can make a gate, identity or not, using a reaction scheme. Okay, so let's follow the idea. Well, you can combine such gates and get logic. So for example, there is a gate. If you uh, use this signal, so uh, this is an inhibiting signal, so large concentration of C translates into low concentration of B, concentration of this guy is low, then concentration of this guy is low, then concentration of this guy is low. But actually, if I use, for example, I can combine uh, generation of these molecules, from a few objects like this one. And depending if I use B or A molecules to code the information, to code generation of this uh, type of molecules, I can make logic gates and so if, if I, for example, use A of two gates, combine them to produce this type of molecules, I have a free child free hand to select the rate constants here. So I may select the concentration of those molecules coming from A, such a way that if I have one uh, such neuron, this is called chemical neuron, in a, in a uh, true state, then this concentration coming from one neuron is not sufficient to, to excite, to, to make true on another neuron. But if I combine two inputs, then I can get uh, sufficiently large concentrations of, of those molecules to generate a true state here. 
So actually, you can excite, you can combine such neurons, excite such neurons, and proceed with a neural network of chemical uh, neurons or chemical reactions like this one. So, okay, so we can build a, a neural network with chemistry, and that, that has been done uh, in 90s. Well, okay, so the idea of using chemical reactions, enzymatic reactions, uh, was quite interesting, and I'll show you what, can, what more can be done. Uh, this reaction scheme, okay, it's nice, but if you like to build a gate, you need, sorry, you need at least three neurons of that type, and each of them involves its own molecules. So the number of molecules needed to, to construct something simple grows pretty fast. But you can do it in a simpler way. There are reactions, there are enzymes that are allosteric. And allosteric enzyme has a couple of sites in which uh, different molecules can be attached. So, for example, this is an allosteric enzyme which has active sites A and B. And so let's assume that if C molecules comes, okay, it, it can take this position. And if there is a molecule of C in this position, this position doesn't change. So molecule of D can fit this position and an enzyme can have uh, can make a complex with two substrates, C here and D here. However, if D molecules comes first, then the structure of this active site changes, and the molecule of C does not fit to uh, its original active site, and there, there is no complex if C uh, if D molecule occupies its active size first. So this is a kind of allosteric. We have two. Allosteric means that we have a choice of two sides. And this is a, a kind of complex that is inhibited by the presence of, of D molecules. Uh, okay, so for, for, for the rest of discussion, I need uh, the information that there are enzymes that can combine with not one, but two molecules. Let's assume that we like to process information with enzymatic reaction of this type. And we do it such a way that there is a substrate that goes to the product Z. And we are interested how substrates, how concentration of substrate transforms into concentration of product Z. And we use different enzymatic complexes. We are, we'll assume that this reaction is catalyzed by different enzymatic complexes. Among enzymatic complexes, we can uh, select a complex with two X molecules, or X and Y molecules, YX, or NX. OK, if we consider just this reaction, then Concentration of, uh, assuming that concentration of S is constant, will continuously produce Z and there is no stationary state. So we should kill Z to stabilize it and we, we do it in a couple of processes. So we inflow molecules of X and Y. Okay, th sorry, there are our input molecules. X and Y are the input molecules, not S. Uh, but the they, they, they inter substrate is kept constant, but uh, the, the, the interesting molecules are X and Y, and we assume that Z can disappear uh, and transform into X or Y, and also we have extra processes in which X disappears. And this is a complex reaction scheme in which such molecule uh, complexes, enzyme complexes can be born. Okay, so this is concentration of X, this is concentration of Y, and this is concentration of, this is the rate of production of Z. If we use both complexes, so we treat equally X and Y, then 
the large production of uh, Z molecules occurs when uh, both concentrations of X and Y are high. That's pretty obvious. If we use all complexes equally contributing to production of Z, then it doesn't matter for high concentration of X, you can have uh, high production for high concentration of without molecules of Y, you can have high production of Z alternatively, or if there are both of them present, then there is also a, a, a high rate of production of Z. So it means that we have OR gate. You can make XOR, assuming that uh, complexes in which X and Y uh, complex with an enzyme do not produce Z, and well, you can make NOT gate. And actually, this scheme, if you look at the name of Privman and Katz, they are the people who study experimentally uh, enzymatic reaction, allosteric enzymatic reaction, to identify logic gates in such system. So this is logic gate. Let me consider, well, what's time? Okay. Let me consider yet another system with alternative information coding. It's quite fun. Uh, so far, we assume that the input is a value of concentration, a constant value of concentration of some molecules, and the output is also coded in concentration, in a stationary concentration of, of molecules. But actually, you can use periodic flow instead of a constant value. And this system is pretty funny. I, maybe I don't go into details. But what I want to say is that if here is the amplitude of input flow and here is the frequency of input flow, it answers in the following way. Look, look at the numbers. So this is the fourth number, uh, the fourth digit after the dot. So it changes. Okay, here the, uh, the frequency changes by let's say 2%, here the amplitude is, changes by, uh, is changing by one less than 1%. But you can, see, you can see critical behavior. In this region of frequencies, the output concentrations are at low values of Y. In this region, the output concentrations are at high values of, of an interesting component Y. So this is a discriminator of time dependence of the input reagent X. And you can, oops, you can make an analysis of, 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 the, of this system and show that this is a pretty precise discriminator. If you like to say, okay, um, what kind of cycle I feel? Is it a daily cycle or it's, uh, uh, well, let's say, lights uh, are appearing at different frequency than the one you use, uh, than the daily life, uh, in daily light, then this kind of discriminator can precisely tell you about, uh, recognize the frequency and the amplitude of your perturbation, of your periodic perturbation, answering in high level or low level oscillations of, of, of a selected reagent. So actually the character of oscillations can be determined by a chemical system, by a system of chemical reactions. I don't go into this into detail, maybe I go just to show you something. Uh, Luca mentioned it during his uh, presentation that in some cases you work with a finite number of molecules, in his case uh, DNA, in our case a finite number of enzyme molecules. If you have a small number of molecules, then the right way to write kinetic equations is to determine time-dependent probability distribution of 
uh, finding n molecules of a given component in your system. And there is a, a theory of master equations or uh, Bert and that equations that tell you how the probability distribution changes. And of course, the states here are discrete states uh, described by numbers of molecules, and the probability is related to reactions, to a jump uh, to another state according to how many molecules were consumed or appeared in it in a given system. So actually, even for small numbers of molecules, you can work out a theory and make predictions. OK, but maybe I go to another part. Uh, yeah. So uh, most of results I'm, I'm going to show uh, in the second part of my talk I, are based on the of jabotinsky reaction. <laughs> So I'm about to show you. OK. So this is the magic. I'm not sure if it's real time. Probably it's slightly faster. But watch. The system is red, then turns blue. Wait a while. It's red again. Now it's blue, and so on. Depends how long you want to wait. Wait, but usually for half an hour you observe oscillations. And what you really see is the level of uh, oxidation of the catalyst. Here it's ferroin. So if it's at this oxidation level, the system is red. If it's at this oxidation level, the system is blue. So there is a reaction scheme. There is an autocatalytic step. It's quite complex reaction, which involves um, uh, different types of uh, bromine ions. This is a highly, uh, there's a oxidant. Uh, there, there is a catalyst. Everything is an acid in an acid environment, and you have uh, the, or, an organic substance. It's like a burning organic substance with the presence of catalyst. Here are the people. It's quite interesting story because uh, oscillatory reactions were not popular in chemistry in the uh, 50s when it was discovered. And the, the, the process was discovered by this guy, Boris Byousov, who was actually a general of Red Army. Not a general, but Combrick. Uh, at, at, at the moment he was in the Red Army, he was in the Soviet Union, there were no generals. And he worked in a chemical institute, maybe he was one of the founders of Novichok, but anyway, he, he did a lot of secret work. Anyway, in the 50s, he observed this oscillatory process. Not precisely the one I was showing you, but with cerium catalyst, which is yellowish and white. And he wrote a paper. The paper was rejected uh, with the comment that the author does not know that uh, there are no oscillations in a closed system. Oscillations in closed system are impossible. Well, uh, could you imagine the situation? He was a general of Red Army, and a stupid academician sends him an idiotic comment. So he got angry with academia and said goodbye. However, the rumors passed, and this guy, I met him personally, Simon Schnoll, was a young student at that time, or maybe young postdoc at that time, and he was traveling the, uh, through different universities in Soviet Union at that time. And he was asking, maybe you have heard who did oscillatory chemical reaction. And after one seminar, uh, a student approached him and said, OK, th 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 this is a family member. 
But we also didn't like to talk to any people of academia. And after some negotiations, he sent a prescription for the reaction to Schnau. Well, the, 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 the story is pretty long because it took two years to get the right components and so and so and so. Anyway, Schnau was able to produce oscillations. And then Jabotinsky appeared as a PhD student of Schnau and uh, developed the version, the blue and red version of reaction you know now. So actually, to me, that should be, the reaction should be called the use of Schnorr Jabotinsky. But, yeah. I know about this guy, or I should say I knew Jabotinsky because he died a couple of years ago. Okay, um, there are a couple of things about this reaction. First, there is an excitable region. So this is the region in which uh, slightly before the system turns from red to uh, blue. And uh, this reaction is related to rapid change in oxidation level. This is red guy, this is blue guy. And you can see that this process is an uh, uh, autocatalytic process. So actually, from molecule of this guy, of activator, two molecules appear. OK, the, the reactions are, per, uh, I would say, simplified, summarized. but. So this is the, the, the rapid transition between red and uh, uh, blue. There is another process, and it's like in the uh, neuron system. The system is refractory. The system is refractory because those activating guys, where they are, uh, OK. Those activated guys are killed by high concentration of Br minus ions in the solution. And those Br minus ions appear from high concentration of, of this blue agent. So when the system is blue, when there is large concentration of blue catalyst, oxidized catalyst, the, 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 it involves production of Br minus ions, and those Br minus ions inhibit the reaction, killing uh, uh, this um, uh, autocatalyzing agent. So the system is refractory, and in this period, when there are too, too many Br minus ions, the system cannot be excited. And there is a resting state in which Br minus ions are absorbed, and uh, the concentration drops. So this is more or less what are the concentration. Of course, this is not the only reaction. We studied fixed hook Nagumo model, which is similar from a mathematical point of view. We studied oxidations on platinum, which is quite interesting uh, reaction that works at high temperature. And there are different models of the also Jabotinsky reaction. For example, this one is for reaction that is inhibited by light. I will tell about it a bit later. So if you, sorry, if you use uh, light, then you can kill uh, um, uh, uh, a chemical process. OK, so now, yes. Sorry. I need to replug into part two. Uh, yes. So if you like to ask me a question, please do it. So we can, can have a couple of questions for you, Yersi. How long does it uh, take for this uh, for the system that you, that you showed to get to, a, to an equilibrium and or a, a normal chemical computer, how long does it take to, to get to, a, to an equilibrium? So, sorry, I'm not catching your question. Sorry, once again, could you repeat it? It's here. Basically, I'm, I'm asking how fast does it take normally uh, or the, the fastest chemical reaction that you, that you got to, to get to an equilibrium and to, to actually do the computations? Oh, you refer to the first part. Yeah, well, you see, well, probably the fastest reactions 
are at the level of 10 to minus 6 of a second. It's, it's an explosion. So if you, if you have explosive processes and if you like to calculate something with explosives, then you, you, you can go to milliseconds. Uh, so, so if you have this um, cycle, this behavior in a cycle, you, you basically build a clock, right? Yes. So can you plug in this clock somewhere? Yes, 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 yes. Actually, well, uh, there are many clocks in the uh, cell cycles, and they, 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 they well, they, they, they are all important. So, actually, if you have a large network of reactions in the, inside the cell, there are many oscillatory processes there, and they regulate it. Okay, sorry. Are there any other questions? If not, maybe I show you uh, the other part yes, of. There's one more question. Yes. So you mentioned there was this uh, person who did not believe that you could have oscillations in a closed system. Yes. And that's a quite interesting, probably, story because I've heard that you know people did not believe that would be possible for a long time, and Locke in the 20s showed that a very simple system that theoretically could oscillate closed system. That was kind of like a breakthrough. Would you comment on that? Uh, uh, why people didn't believe that it could happen and, and so on? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, so uh, you refer to the work of Lotka and there were the models of ecological system. Uh, so the Lotka observed changes in, I think this of, 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 of a uh, number of rabbit and uh, fox skins purchased by uh, Hudson Company in Canada. And uh, when the, there was a year with a lot of rabbits, then after some time, so maybe after a year, I, I'm not a biologist, foxes started to uh, grow using large resources. So, Actually, it was uh, the, the, the number of fox skins uh, the company could buy was increasing, and when the number of foxes uh, reached the critical level, they, they were able to kill so many rabbits, then the population of rabbits dropped, and of course, foxes had too little food, so they, they started dying, and the cycle repeated after 10 years or so. So the, 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 there were the data of 19th century. Uh, company records, and they were probably one of the first oscillations in ecological systems notice. But I think this knowledge didn't came to chemistry, and chemistry of 50s were pretty orthodox, and th there was a kind of assumption that if you have a closed system, the system should approach equilibrium in a uniform way, and the fact that entropy increases um, doesn't allow for any periodic changes in a closed system. Actually, if you calculate entropy of closed system with the of jabotinsky reaction, entropy production and so on, it's always positive. So this entropy increases, but the changes are reflected by concentration, uh, by oscillations in concentration. So the fact that uh, concentrations are oscillating does not imply that uh, entropy is going up and down. Entropy is, is uniformly increasing in such a system, but uh, you observe oscillation. I, I, I don't know why people haven't in mind a very simple system, an engine <coughs> with pet, uh, petrol engine. If you have gasoline, then, well, pet, uh, petrol engines rotate. So there are oscillations at the cost of gasoline. When you run out of the gasoline, then, well, the engine stops and there are no longer oscillations. You can keep oscillations forever, supplying the gasoline constantly, and actually this happens in an open system. You can run the also Jabotinsky reaction in open reactors. I'm not sure if it answers. Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay. okay, so maybe I go fast with special temporal structure. 
sorry, I, I, I take a seat because I will need a mouse to operate faster than uh, with this funny device. And there are some films to show you. Okay, so let's go. So this is the same dose of Jabotinsky reaction, but we pour it into a dish, a petri dish, and to observe what's happening. The wire you see is a silver wire, and silver is known as the basis of photography uh, as an absorber of bromine ions. So actually, concentration of Br minus, this agent that kills activation, is slightly lower here. And then this, this, the, the tip of the wire becomes a source of excitations in the system. So you can see so-called target wave spreading out the medium. The rest of the medium is still oscillating. So the, the oscillations of uh, waves here are the phase waves. They, they, uh, you can observe them as waves because the system was inhomogeneous. Maybe I run it once again. The, 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 the phase was inhomogeneous at, at the beginning. Okay, so this example shows that you can generate waves in views of Jabotinsky medium. And it's quite obvious to use those waves as uh, information carrier. I can tell you that the propagating wave carries well, let's say, a uh, true state in space. So it's like a spike in electronic system. That... Okay, so how to describe it? It's sufficient to add diffusion to your equations and then you have spatially <coughs> distributed system. Mm -hmm. That's another story. We have some reactions that are inhibited by light. So imagine that we have, well, tape recorder, that's an old picture, slide projector that delivers uh, light to the system, and a membrane filled with reagents of the of jabotinsky reaction. And this is uh, if this slide projector is switched off, so the system is not illuminated, that's after a while such nice structure appeared. Actually, this is so-called scroll waves. There are two spirals, two interacting spirals, and it's a kind of stable structure that appears in two-dimensional uh, medium with Bios of Jabotinsky reaction. So first, you will observe for a few seconds what happens in this system, and then we switch illumination on. <laughs> I like it. Ah, okay. Sorry. I was too fast. Okay, so there are spirals. They, they, they rotate. And we are illuminating the system. And where in the area where illumination is high, all uh, activity is killed, and the system has a single uh, state. You can use illumination for computation. Uh, but you should be clever, and it's very difficult. So Andamatsky is, is pretty clever with such systems. If you introduce modulation, then depending on the amplitude of modulation and the amplitude uh, and the frequency of modulation, here this is modulated with 66 seconds frequency, this Oh, sorry, I should tell what is this, what you see. There is, imagine that there is a busy medium around, and what is marked in dark is the position of a pulse. So let me go back. So, okay, so this is my medium, and I mark in dark, for example, the position of this fragment of the wave. So at the moment is here, when I press, it moved here, so there would be another. Uh, the, the, the wave moves to, a, to another, another, another position. So, um, what, 
what is marked on this picture are superimposed positions of uh, a wave propagating wave fragment. So actually you have, at, at the beginning you have a wave that is dark here, then it moved here, then it moved here, then it moved here. Remember that this medium, you can imagine that the membrane is like this, is constantly illuminated. So this illumination killed propagation. Well, similarly in this state, but here, using proper uh, light strength and proper uh, frequency of modulation of this light, you can have a wave fragment that doesn't expand throughout the whole space. Remember the first film I shown you with this uh, rings uh, spreading around the pin, the tip. So there is no spreading of uh, the excitation throughout the space, but it just propagates in something like a channel. So if you are very clever, you can send information. You can say, okay, this is bit one, propagating in space. We have its position uh, recorded at different time, and finally it arrived here. And we can play tricks with a couple of beats. So, for example, there are two beats colliding and disappearing. Uh, excitation in such system, a good model to imagine excitation, is dry grass. If you have a bush with dry grass, then this is a, this is excitable medium. Excitable medium is similar to uh, oscillatory one, but it's slightly different. In oscillatory medium, you have oscillation, so the system changes its states, then goes back to the initial state, but after a while, this excitation or the change of the state reappears. In excitable medium, uh, you have the situation like with the dry bush. So at the beginning, grass grows, becomes dry, and that's all. The system is dry. But if somebody makes fire, then this fire expands in space. So excitation needs an extra, excitable system needs an extra kick to show its activity. Oscillatory one, doesn't need a kick because it will self-excite after, after, after a while. Of course, if oscillation period is longer than the, the time of your experiment, it doesn't matter if you use oscillatory or excitable medium. However, to use excitable medium, you, you need some tricks. So, okay, so Adamatsky is good in using excitable medium. And here is the medium with two pulses initiated. And you can see that they came to a single region of space and then they died. So actually you can say, okay, this is, this is a kind of gate in which from two inputs you generate output that is uh, false so if, the, if the presence of a pulse is true. So you can, uh, I'm showing it to show that if you are very clever, and if you use the right modulation, you can make channels in a medium that is homogeneous, just by proper excitation of this medium and proper modulation of light. But I'm not that clever, so what I did is the medium that is, okay, this, this is still a simple experiment. You have a labyrinth. Uh, the medium is illuminated here, so there is no wave propagation outside this dark part, and it's excitable in the dark part. So uh, excitable means there are no excitations of this medium anywhere else than at the point I'm intentionally exciting the medium with silver wire. And let's assume that I would like to measure the distance in the labyrinth between this point and between the, this point. How can I do it? Well, the, the answer is simple. Let's excite the wave. 
It takes some time, but finally the wave arrives to the point I'm interested in. So if I know the wave, prop the wave propagation time, I can tell that the distance in the labyrinth between one point and another one is the time at which I observe wave in the point of my interest divided by velocity of the wave, which is, well, it depends a bit on curvature, but not that much. So there is no faster algorithm. It's extremely parallel. It tries uh, all the paths at the same time. There is no better algorithm to find the, the, the uh, uh, length of uh, uh, a path between connecting two points in the labyrinth. I will continue to show you some, uh, okay. Oops, mm, maybe they are up here. Okay, look what happens to those two wave fragments. It's like two fire storms that come one to another. And uh, if you follow what happens here, they do not cross each other, they just two fires that leave fired grass after a while, and there is nothing in the medium should recover is in a fractory state. Okay, so there is no, no, nothing. Okay, so we have one fantastic algorithm that works with chemistry. Actually, this, this algorithm has been modified to track uh, what I was telling in the simplest version, it uh, it's just gives you how to, what is the distance in the labyrinth between two points, but it can be uh, modified to get the, 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 to trace the length of, uh, the, 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 the way of um, uh, uh, the, uh, I mean to try to, to, to say what is the path connecting this point. This is another bloody efficient algorithm that was invented in the 90s, at the beginning of the 90s. The original paper is 89. Now the system is oscillatory. It's oscillatory, but it's initiated in a funny way. The, this is il initial illumination of a membrane containing reagents of Bielus of Jabotinsky reaction. So if I illuminate some parts, and if I don't illuminate another part, then I set different initial conditions at this part, because there are different concentrations of ions in illuminated and non-illuminated sectors. So now I, 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 I illuminated my membrane, and after a while I switch off illumination, and look what happens. Haha. -ha. Okay, yes, it works. Yeah, so at the moment the system is illuminated. Now I switch the illumination. What you can see, oh, I, I'm not able to stop it. Okay, maybe I follow on. So there was a moment you can see the contours only. Now the system disappeared. Now you have color inversion, then contours. Then the system returns to the previous state with slightly smooth boundaries. Then it reappears with the uh, color uh, inverse, contours, and so, and so. And this is all done with uh, chemical reaction. It doesn't matter how many pixels you take. It's bloody parallel, it's the most parallel algorithm you can invent. But it works with chemistry. So there were rumors that Soviet used this algorithm to process satellite pictures, uh, photos, but I, I, I'm not sure if it's true. Okay, so this is, this is, this is the, the, what you see. Original picture, color invention, contour enhancement, well, return, and then the cycles reappears with smooth boundaries due to diffusion. Uh, 
Okay, there are two algorithms. Those two algorithms really focus attention on chemical information processing, but I'm sorry to say that after those two algorithms, uh, we haven't, well, I hope, we, we have approached an interesting system recently, but for a long time, we're trying to do something. So I, how many times? Okay, I think I have something like 10 minutes. So, uh, yesterday we have heard that um, um, synapse is a kind of magic object in nerve system. And here you have the system that is excitable, this is the red one, and the system that is not excitable. So uh, it's, it's, it's like a synapse. We can send signals, I hope they appear, okay. So the synapse is the same on this and this picture, so okay. The signal comes perpendicularly to the synapse and crosses it. Now the signal propagates parallel to the boundary, and you can see it doesn't cross it, but the boundary is exactly the same. So there is a strong influence on, of geometry on uh, the behavior of, of structured excitable media. So let's assume we have two channels. There is a pulse propagating, it comes perpendicular to so those here, but look what's here. So we can regulate, using pulses, we can regulate the direction of propagation of, of pulses in the system. Well, another funny thing is, is a, a chemical diode. So this is such inhomogeneous synapse, and the signal propagates from this side to this side. But if you go here, then activator is dissipated, and the stimulus is lower. So we can have a diode that directs uh, signals. This is funny. Oops, uh, maybe I stop it. Uh, we have two channels. Signal propagates in this channel, and this is a, a detector, we call it coincidence detector. So if a signal, you can see a propagating pulse, the actual, it's one millimeter wide, uh, this, this black stripe, if, if the pulse propagated, if a signal pulse propagated in this channel, the channel, well, it's, it remains unexcited. But, oh, uh, Sorry. <laughs> so now let's use two, two excitations in, in this channel. They, they will counter-propagate. One propagates down, another goes up. So they come together like two firestorms. And hurrah, we have a signal. So actually, this is end gate. Two signals can produce a signal in the detector, single signal doesn't. Okay, we can make other gates as well. This is maybe not that exciting. We can make memory. Maybe I show you the memory here. Memory is a kind of ring in which a signal propagates. So the signal propagates around the ring, and we can kill it by sending counter-propagating signal from the central part. So we can make memory with chemistry. We can use this memory. I hope it works. Yes. OK. So this is a channel, and a signal propagates in a channel. And if this memory is not loaded, it can go from uh, up, down, without any perturbation. But look what happens if memory is loaded. Then we have a signal propagating around this ring. It splits here, and it sends pulses propagating up. Those pulses, oh, sorry, too short, 
kill the signal going down. So actually we can have channels that, that propagate. We can make neurons. And neuron is a structure that is excited by a given number of pulses. So here there are two excitations that come to the central part, to this neuron body. They propagate into, well, and parameters were selected such that they die. Whereas here you have three impulses coming together. It seems that they are dying, but actually this excitation is sufficient to excite neurons' body, and we can identify the parameters where. Uh, okay, so let me tell you something different, and something different means chemical sensing. So far, I was telling about, well, application of digital uh, logic to chemical systems. But let's assume you, there is a bacteria or whatever, an object that likes to sense something. Sense something means there is something that sends signals around, and this, this, this bacteria likes to know if the source of signals is far away or it's close. There were different strategies, but I will show you something we developed, and this is, this is fine. Uh, well, before, I, I show the following picture. Here is a busy medium. The, this, this white part is illuminated. The other part is dark. It's excitable, and here you have a very nice scroll that sends signal to this channel and the signal passes the gate, well, that looks like a diode, and generates the output signal. Look at the frequency. There are many stripes coming, but every second stripe passes to the output channel. And this is a common effect in excitable medium. The fact that, uh, depending on its properties, the gap can modify the frequency of the signal. So here you have, uh, well, very common effect of uh, frequency that is half of the original one. Okay. Actually, the system is much more complex, and we, we studied the, the effect in details with my graduate student, Jakub Szelewiesiu. And uh, there is a devil staircase structure of modes. So the most pronounced mode is the frequency that it's half. Then there is another promote, uh, pronounced mode of one third of original frequency, one fourth to five. But actually, we observe a lot that there were simulations. We observe a lot of different modes in simulations. So I'm telling it to, t to, to say that. Uh, the effect is very sensitive with respect to width of the barrier, to frequency of incoming signal, but also to geometry of, of, of signal that arrives at the barrier. And here is the idea of uh, a sensor. If the object is close to uh, our sensors, then the angles at which Signal, okay, sorry, I, I, uh, I'm making it too short. Gray is excitable medium. This upper part is the medium outside our cell, let's say. This is, the white part is a cell body that works as a um, uh, synapse, so this is not excitable medium. But there are some excitable mediums, channels, you can say, inside the body. If an object that gives you excitations is close, then you can see that the wave vectors at different channels are very different. Here, the, 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 the excitation attacks the channel perpendicularly. Here, it slides 
along the cell body. If the object is far away, then the angles at which excitation arrives to different channels is different. So we can expect different frequencies. Uh, so, uh, uh, okay, if it's close, then the angles are very different. If it's far away, the angles are pretty the same. So if we consider frequencies of pulses excited in those channels, if they are the same, the object is far away. If they are different, the object is close. And we developed a theory, maybe that's not, not the most interesting, but I'll show you what's happening in experiments. So we have channels here, and you can see pulses coming to all four channels uh, on, on the picture. And this is firing number. So this is what is the ratio of original, of, of the frequency observed in channels to the original frequency. And well, there the numbers are pretty the same. If you have the, the, the source of excitation very close to your barrier, then there are a lot of excitations in this channel, those two channels. There are occasional excitations here, and there are no excitations here. So actually, by comparing frequencies of signals, you can tell uh, if the object is far away or close to, to our detector. And I like it because this is a kind of sensing. Well, OK, I skip this part. And I make it as an introduction to the next part, because Everything I, 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 I told you was designed by, 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 by an external designer. And what I'm going to tell you in the next part after lunch is, is there any way to self-organize structures that are needed for information processing? So I think I finish at this moment. And I'm, I would be happy to answer questions if you have. Thank you so much for this amazing talk. I think we have time just for one question, and then we uh, need to uh, have a coffee break. Uh, so good morning. Uh, thanks for the, this talk. It's very um, disruptive in, in terms of that we are not really used to get uh, computation in different ways than the normal ones. So we have been connecting the docs during this week. Uh, we had uh, molecular programming, uh, quantum computing, and now we have chemical computing. So we have been saying that uh, we should focus on computers that are not that generalized, but focus. So I'm seeing that, for example, this type of computing could be used in biological applications. So for example, this clock in pharma industry, in therapeutics, and so when we have to time the drug release in your body, I could, be, I could see lots of views. Could you comment on this? Uh, it's, there is a plan to apply this in real life, or it's just very theoretical? OK. Uh, well, the, 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 the information I passed you during this talk was mainly to show what has been done, and it was kind of um, I would say, uh, a review of a couple of ideas. Actually, two, two, two fast algorithms is this prairie fire algorithm of labyrinth searching and the image processing. Um, <clears throat> so they, they were interested as a kind of concepts. But during the talk, uh, well, and the, the main problem with application of, well, with this approach, is that um, strategies were designed in a, a bottom up, using bottom up strategies. So it's hard to make, well, you can make it, but uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy way to make gates working with views of Jabotinsky reaction, demonstrate that then work, and then blah, blah, okay, if we have gates, then blah. Somebody clever can make a large structure of this gate. But this bottom-up approach is extremely inefficient. So in my talk after lunch, I will tell you about another approach. So we have a problem. 
and we have a chemical system. And my answer would be, with what accuracy I can solve a given problem having a given medium? So, for example, I will touch the problem of classifiers, of chemistry-based classifiers. And uh, to classify a database, as an example, I will use Wisconsin Cancer Breast Database that contains about 700 records. To make a classifier of this database with gates, come on, 10,000 gates or so. But actually, it comes out that 16 chemical oscillators do the work with accuracy of 90% due to classification efforts. So I will show you a completely different strategy of self-organizing. This is, this is what I'm showing here. You see, nice thing about chemistry, we haven't approached this point yet, is that, okay, this is a structure of triple component system. Water, so imagine that this is the medium, oil, and surfactant. In our case, it's, there are lipids, water is replaced by bills of Jabotinsky medium. At the moment, we are at this point. We can generate droplets, interacting droplets, for example, using artificial techniques like um, microfluidics that make, can make information processing structures. But a nice thing would be to come somewhere where we have, okay, somewhere here. One of the structure in this diagram is a beautiful double diamond structure. And at certain condition is dynamically stable. It has self-growing properties and is three-dimensional. So this is, to me, this is the direction uh, where chemical computing should go. So we have three-dimensional structure. Uh, being thermodynamically stable, it has self-healing properties. And if we are able to adopt this structure for, to solve a certain problem, I, I don't dream about universal computer because the, that's probably not the way chemistry is designed to, then we have something, well, probably the other, any other approach is, is not able to repeat, especially the fact that it's thermodynamically stable. Uh, we should be back. Ideally, we would be back at 11, but let's give it a little, a little bit more, five minutes, because uh, we also start a little bit later. So let's try to be here at 11.05, please. Okay. Thank you.